glad to see you come out of it looking so well. You're still a very good-looking fella. Well, you've, you've come through it all right, too, you, Zell, oh, I'm not mate. quite as rugged a game as you. Anyway, we're going to be talking about it at great length during the interview a little later on, so uh, stick around, will you? I won't go away. Yes. Jack Rennie. Are you doing an interview with Lionel Rose? Lionel Rose, how are you? No, I'm doing a, an interview with uh, Jimmy Carruthers here. One world champion at a time is enough for me. Well, I'm left down all the way from oh, well, I'm terribly sorry, uh, Jack. This is embarrassing, but this is the man I'm interviewing. I think it's my surprise, Jack. Oh. Mike Willisey. Lionel? How are you? Mike Willisey, how are you? Fine, thanks. I've got a surprise for you because yeah. tonight you're yeah. the guest of honour. <laughs> Jimmy Carruthers. Tonight, Lionel, you're guest of honour on our program. I've been waiting for you in another stage, Studio C, to say to you, Lionel Rose... This is your life. Okay. Nice to see you. I think you're still a little stunned. Yes, uh, I am. No, let's start. I think there have been few more important events in your life than this one. A quarter of a million people lining the streets cheering you every foot of the way to the Melbourne Town Hall. Nobody, including royalty, the Beatles or the American president, has ever drawn a crowd like you drew that day. At 19 years of age, you're a champion of the world. Within a few months, you were named Australian of the Year, later awarded an MBE for your contribution to sport. An impressive achievement for a, a young Aborigine in a community not noted for giving your people such glory. It certainly was a, a show and a half then. Lionel Rose, you were born in Warrigal in Victoria on the 21st day of June 1948. Your father Roy is a tent fighter and as a little boy growing up you live with your father and your mother Regina in a shanty settlement at Jackson's Track, about 60 miles from Melbourne. When you reach school age, nobody thinks much about your education, and your attendance at school is, to say the least, infrequent. Yes. You, you're more likely to be found in the fencing wire ring you build near your home, your fists wrapped in old towels, trying out the moves your boxing father has shown to you. In 1958, you were chosen with three other Aboriginal children to travel to Melbourne to help raise money for Save the Children. Yes, sir. I met Lionel on that visit to Melbourne. It became the first of many. Well, I'm sure you know who that is, Lionel. Uh, Graham Walsh, newspaper yeah, photographer yeah, in those times, right. today Victorian Secretary of the AJA. Yeah. Graham Walsh. Yeah. Graham, you were covering that event for your newspaper then, and I think Lionel wanted to do one particular thing. He wanted to go to the stadium. He uh, wanted to see the stadium. When he heard when I, uh, that I'd done a bit of uh, professional boxing, I became a bit of a hero, and he wanted to be a mate. And we became mates. Yeah, certainly have been for many, many yeah. years. Yeah. Now, Graham, some weeks after that, you invite Lionel down to see another fight, and his marvellous grandmother, Adelaide Rose, who was then almost 70, hitchhikes with him to Melbourne. That's right. And she did that regularly, uh, particularly when George Bracken fought. Uh, I can remember a Friday's off work when uh, we'd look out the window at Blackburn and uh, we'd see two dark figures walking across the paddock towards our place. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and Grandma would, uh, would deliver him. And quite often she wouldn't even stay for a cup of tea. She'd turn around and go back again. Uh, but uh, oh, she was a really wonderful old lady and uh, Sounds uh, remarkable. tremendous dignity. Well, Lionel, your grandmother's 86 now, and uh, that's a bit old for hitchhiking to programs like yeah. this. But she still remembers her first grandson. 
Lionel was a lovely little boy. Lovely. Well, thank you, Adelaide, Rose, and Graham Walsh. Thanks for taking your part in Lionel's life tonight. Thank you very much, Mark. See you again, Mark. Lionel, that first time your grandmother hitchhiked you down to see George Bracken fight, he became your boyhood idol. And he became like a mascot to me. It's Lionel, that's one of our greatest lightweight champions, George Bracken. George. George, I think Lionel didn't miss too many of your Melbourne fights. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mike, he was, had quite a number of them. Quite a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. one. Uh, <laughs> he was your to, idol. Yeah. I used to take him in my corner as, a, as my mascot. Yeah, that's now. right. <laughs> exactly. What about advice to him, George? Uh, yes, well, I used to tell him a lot that I was trying to help him to, uh, in, the, in the fight game. I knew he was going to take on the fight game. And, uh, Any warnings? Yes, I told him that uh, he'd have to take the uh, ups and the downs and uh, watch out when he's on the uh, going down. Because uh, it was very bad, you know, very bad. Exactly, yes. I think you used to refer to Lionel's father giving him some advice about going into boxing too. Uh, that's right, yes. Uh, his father used to, uh, with no uh, father one time, he used to say to Lionel, well, uh, what I've always said, that uh, uh, when you're going up, on, when you're on the upper upgrade, everyone's with you. But when you're on the downgrade, uh, you're there on your own. And was boxing the right game for Lionel? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think you gave him some particular advice about that. I'll try to help him in my little small way, but <laughs> I think he's done a lot on his own. I think he even went so far once to say that boxing was the game because it was the only place where an Aboriginal might That's be treated right, as Aboriginal might be uh, well, treated as, as an equal. Uh, because uh, without people, we've uh, got to start from uh, beyond the pool. Well, I, I think your advice, Lionel, was pretty good. George Bracken, thanks very much for joining yeah, us tonight. Mate. When you were 10 years of age, Lionel, you moved to another shack closer to town. You hear about a youth centre in the nearby town of Warrigal, and you become interested in training there. One night in the Warrigal gym, I saw a little dark face pressed up against the window. From Pye Long, Victoria, the man who's been with you a long time now, Frank Oaks. I rang you before this, didn't I? <laughs> Frank, what did you do about that little face at the window? Well, Mike, I, uh, I went outside and I brought Lionel in and uh, I asked him to uh, do a little bit of work on the heavy bag and keep warm. And uh, later on I found that he'd walked about five miles from Druin uh, to get there, so I drove him home. And then he started training with you? He trained, uh, he turned up every week and trained very hard. OK, after six months of training, Lionel, you decide you're ready to fight. You accept an invitation from Dave Proctor to join a group of Warrigal boys going into sail for amateur night. Uh, you're 12 years of age and you weigh just about five stone. Yeah, five, six. But you're disappointed when you find there is no boxer in the sail team your weight and you feel that the long journey may have been wasted. Then you see another boy who's not been matched and although he's more than a stone above your weight, you challenge him. Yeah, that's fine. How did you go? I lost it, the hell out of me. <laughs> well, that mystery boy you fought that night disappeared from boxing and I guess has just remained a disturbing memory. Was a disturbing memory. <laughs> but this is your life that's found him. And here with us tonight from Hayfield, Victoria, Jim Beaumont. So you still got the red hair? Yes. That's all you remember? Yeah, he oh, looks like the fellow that... <laughs> you say you still got the red hair? Yes. That's all you remember? Yeah, oh, he looks like the fellow that did it in my words. <laughs> you don't want to pay him back? No. no. <laughs> Jim, how old were you when that fight took place? 14, mate. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Were you surprised when he wanted to fight you? Oh, you know, sort of. 
but he was pretty confident, you know, that he could beat me. Well, he must have been because you, Jim Beaumont, a stone or more heavier and two years older, had just returned from Melbourne where you'd won the Victorian Junior Flyweight title. That's right. I didn't know this, though. <laughs> Lionel, that wasn't very good matchmaking, was it? Not my pad, no. <laughs> Jim Beaumont, thanks very much for making your first plane trip to be with good. us tonight. Thank you. See you again. That night, Lionel, you were the only loser on the Warrigal team. On the long trip home, battered and bruised, you decided to retire from boxing for good. And you did, in fact, stay out for two years. Yeah. But now there are nine children in the family, and the only money that comes into the house is the invalid pension your father receives because he's too ill to work. So at 14, you decide to fight again. I think there were three country fights first, and one was very important because you beat a good fighter and your father was at ringside. Yeah, that was chance to see you. Uh, David, Dixon. Uh, David Dixon at the uh, technical school in Warrigal, in my hometown, and uh, and your dad got the chance finally to see yeah, you. Yeah, and uh, you know I, I had to win, and I did, uh, fortunately. Well, following that, Frank, you arranged for Lionel to fight an amateur preliminary to a professional bout at Melbourne's Festival Hall, and nobody is more excited, Lionel, than your father. He tells everybody who will stop to listen about his son Lionel, aged 15 stepping into that sacred square, but Frank, I think tragedy struck then. Yes, Mike, it did. Uh, Lionel and I arrived in from training uh, about a couple of nights before the fight was due to take place, and uh, Lionel's grandmother came out into the yard and uh, told me that his dad had just passed away. Well, Frank, you wanted to call off the fight, but Lionel, you want to go on with it because you think that's what your father would have wanted. Yes, sir, I wanted to fight because uh, I thought that uh, you know, he was, uh, he taught me the fundamentals of the game. And I knew that he would have wanted me to go on. So I did. And, uh... In fact, you went straight to the, from the funeral to the stadium. And I think Frank Lionel said something to you on the way. Yes, Mike, he did. He said, uh, well, I guess he said it's all up to me now. Uh, Frank, he said, uh, I've got to feed the kids. Well, we'll see how you went about that, Lionel, in just a moment. <laughs> first fight at Festival Hall, Lionel, you win easily on points. You have 14 more fights in your amateur career, winning 12 of them, including Australian flyweight, uh, flyweight title. Right. And that brings us up to 1963. Frank Oak's work makes it difficult for him to take you much further in boxing, so he sends you to Melbourne on weekends to spar at Jack Rennie's gym in Essendon. You quickly become one of the family, and Jack Rennie and wife Shirley find you a job as a spray painter. Lionel was good at spray painting. In six months, he was as good as the men who had been at the plant for years. Well, another of the great friends you've made along the way, and the man who secretly delivered you to us tonight, Jack Rennie. Yeah. You don't want to pay him back for what he's done to you tonight? No, I wasn't too sure what was going on earlier on, but... Well, it's been very nice anyhow, you know, so far. So far? Been, I don't, Jack, know, what, I don't a... know what to expect, actually. I'll just say so far. Okay. Jack, you've been more than a friend, a trainer, a manager, I guess most things to Lionel. Father, too. At times I had to stand on his toes when he got out of line. For what purpose, Jack? Well, he was a chain smoker. He'd been smoking since he was ten, and that was no good for a fighter. Was he always training during the six years he was with you? Well, some, sometimes uh, he'd have a break and then we'd show films and he'd study the great fighters. But he, we, he decided to become a professional, so there's a lot of work to do and we got to it. Right. Lionel, four days after your 17th birthday, and now a professional, you fight your first importation from Thailand. That was uh, Sing Tong Portal. That's right. Jack, who followed? Well, we fought uh, Portal again, um, Teddy Rainbow, Arthur Clark, Bobby Wells. There was a whole uh, succession of them. But by Christmas 1965, Lionel was starting to make what we thought was good money in those days. And that's 
a happy Christmas for you, Lionel, because you can afford toys and clothes for your younger brothers and sisters. Things for your mother. You know she's always needed. Lionel always looked out to his family. He enjoys giving them presents. And there we are, Lionel, the other half of the Rennie team. Shirley Rennie. <laughs> Shirley, when you and Jack took Lionel into your home, you realised that his education is sadly lacking. Yes. You bought him books, I think you enrolled him in correspondence courses. Uh, and on his 21st birthday then, you gave him an electric guitar. That's right. And I, I guess you got a bit sick of those guitars somewhere along the way. I think we could, could have opened a guitar, guitar shop. Yeah, I think there were six or seven guitars. That's right. Another stop saying. <laughs> And then I think to teach him to handle money, you required a sandwich shop. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I think Lionel sang for about three years, please release me from the kitchen. Yeah, Particularly when right. he was locked in the yeah. kitchen to work. <laughs> right. So the eventful teenage years flow by, and in each professional fight, Lionel seems to get better. In 1966, he takes the Australian bantamweight title, and then fights a succession of highly rated local and overseas boxers. In win after win, he also wins the Australian public, who now not only accept him, but claim him as their own. Then comes the big one, Jack, that unexpected phone call. Well, after Lionel beat Gatilari in that great fight, uh, we were sitting at home one night and suddenly there was a promoter on the line from Tokyo. And he said to us, we'd like to offer Rose a fight with Harada for the World Band of my title. Lionel, what did you say to that? Take it. Take it. Take it. <laughs> yeah, Pretty definite. Chance. And then I think you all uh, sat up till about 4.30 in the morning. Yeah, talking about it and uh, planning the fight and we all got out the Redwood books and looking at Harada's record and this sort of thing. You know? Jack and Shirley Rennie, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Lionel, it's barely four years since you left Druin to live with Jack and Shirley. Just three years and four months since you turned professional and now at 19, you're going overseas to meet fighting Harada for the championship of the world. And this is how it ended up. champion of the world. Lionel, uh, <laughs> fighting Harada, where is he today? Uh, I think he's uh, in the gymnasium, in the gymnasium over in Tokyo. I think he's got a couple of uh, hotels and that, that he runs. So he's very, very well off. Well, I can add to your knowledge because I know where he is at this precise moment, walking through that door. Miss Kibura, I would like to speak through you and thanks for helping us. Would you thank Masahiko Harada for coming all the way from Tokyo just to be with us tonight? Mr. Harada thanks you for inviting him, and this is something that he never expected to happen. He's thrilled to see Lionel again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Masahiko has been here before. He he says he was here in 1969 to fight Johnny Farmishon for World Featherweight title. Now, Lionel, just by a coincidence, Johnny Farmishon, one of your closest friends, is he was here in 1969 to fight Johnny Farmishon for World Featherweight title. Now, Lionel, just by a coincidence, Johnny Farmishon, one of your closest friends, is also with us tonight. <laughs> And 
to complete the foursome, here's Jimmy Carruthers, our first ever world champion who helped us surprise Lionel tonight. There's a handful of world champions for you, and just for the record book, it's the first time in Australia we've ever had four of them together at one time. of the world and the response is immediate. Australia takes you to its collective heart. Honours heap upon honours. At Drew and your grandmother, Adelaide Rose, listens to it all quietly, knowing it has taken three generations to get to hold your head this high. You have provided for your family a security they had never known. And representing them here tonight is your younger brother, Michael, one of the children who in those earlier years you fought to feed. footsteps in the ring, undefeated, a junior edition of Lionel Rose. Michael, are you in training now? Yes, I am in training, Mark. I've uh, been working out with Lionel and uh, Frank is training. Yes, that's not a bad double. You think you might be as good as Big Brother? I hope to be. Hope to be. Yeah, good on you. I hope to Michael, thanks for coming and joining us tonight, and good luck. Lionel, on December 16, 1970, you marry Frank Oak's daughter, Jenny. Jenny sends a love tonight. She's at home babysitting with the infant son, Michael. You wrote a book, Lionel Rose, Australian, co-authored by your friend, sporting journalist, Rod Humphreys, who's in the audience with us tonight. You start singing professionally, not the songs from the sandwich shop, but new songs you feel you want to sing. Your first single, I Thank You, becomes a double gold record. Seller is a song that Roy, your father, wrote and taught you as a little boy. You start driving racing cars and do pretty well at that. You lease a race horse and breathe a sigh of relief when it breaks down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Without a care, you eat too much, drink too much, and your weight blows to nearly 13 stone. Yes, yeah, then this year, in March, you take a look at yourself and decide you don't like what you see. Within months, you shed the weight to the point where you're ready to fight again. Now as a junior lightweight. You go to Kuala Lumpur to fight top-rated Shoji Ishida in the main preliminary to the Muhammad Ali Joe Bugner title fight. Yes, you win, and a few weeks later you fight the South African Blakeney Matthews in your old Melbourne stamping ground. So one up, one down, and more to go, yes. and we wish you luck on that journey. Thank you. At 27, Lionel, your future is all ahead of you, held in your own lightning-fast hands. That ends our story, Lionel, but before we go, somebody would like to say good night to you. Good night, Lionel. All my love. Lionel Rose, this is your life.